Hi students, welcome to another e-lesson video, this one over style analysis. We've already gone over basic concepts of analyzing text. Now we're going to focus on one particular type of analyzing text, and that is analyzing style. As with all of these videos, please feel free to pause and rewind at any time to take notes, rewatch, or catch up. Here's what we're going to be looking at on this video, what it means to analyze style, why we analyze style in AP Lang, the, uh, some of the primary stylistic elements that you're looking for, analyzing what we call tropes, and also analyzing what we call schemes. I will get to defining those here in a little bit. First of all, what does it mean to analyze style? We've talked at length in class and in a previous video about what it means to analyze a text, but what does it mean to analyze a text style? Well, essentially, when we analyze style, we're looking at the various stylistic elements and devices in a text. And by elements and devices, I'm looking. Uh, I'm talking about all of those those. Um, devices, those structures that you're taught starting in, in sixth or seventh grade. We're looking for things like um, metaphors and figurative language and imagery and personification. Uh, we're also looking at the advanced stuff that you guys probably haven't gotten into like anadiplosis and epistrophe and those sorts of uh, all those fun Latin and uh, Greek terms um, that we'll get into this year. Those are all what we call devices because they're sort of mechanisms of language. Um, so we're looking at the various stylistic elements and we're examining the effect of those elements when read. There's a reason why authors throw metaphors in their text or use an illusion, for instance. It's because they're trying to achieve a specific effect that goes along with what they're literally trying to say. Like um, all text analysis, we're trying to put together a bigger picture of how an author goes about doing what he or she does uh, and trying to answer the question of why he or she does it this way. This is just common to all text analysis. Um, and because this is style analysis, we're looking at it purely from a stylistic standpoint. We're looking just at the elements of style and, and the effects they have when read, as opposed to looking at it from a rhetorical standpoint, which we'll start doing in late December, or from a literary theory standpoint standpoint, which you'll be doing when you get to AP Lit next year. Uh, for now, I like to just start with looking at bare stylistic elements. Why do we analyze style? You can probably already guess where I'm going with this. This has been kind of a running theme in class for the last couple of weeks. We analyze style in order to examine the effects of stylistic devices and, you guessed it, steal them so we can so we can steal those effective techniques uh, for our own writing and so for also for our own writing we can steer clear of the ineffective techniques that we see uh, so let's talk about what I mean when I say stylistic elements. Here are basically the, um, the, the stylistic elements you need to be looking for when doing a style analysis. When we examine stylistic elements, we're looking at two things. Basically, you can break down all stylistic elements into just two groups. Um, we're looking at the words an author chooses and the way he or she arranges them. When put that way, style analysis really isn't that tough. You're just trying to explain why the author chooses the word he, he or she uses and why does he or she arrange them the way he or she does. Um, similarly, stylistic devices and figures uh, fall into two categories. Uh, tropes, or what, what we call tropes, are a, a collection of devices that have to do with the choice of words. And what we call uh, schemes, or rhetorical schemes, are those devices that have to do with syntax and sound. So you can kind of see how they correspond. And, you know, the two basic elements of style analysis involves looking at words and how they're arranged. It involves looking at tropes and schemes. When you're analyzing tropes, uh, of course, you're looking, uh, you're looking at uh, the word choice of an author. It's a lot more complicated than just looking at uh, an author's diction, for example, uh, which you guys have probably done analysis of uh, in uh, sophomore and freshman year. Um, but it, it follows the same basic line of reasoning, providing you've been doing it correctly. Um, tropes are mainly employed to enhance ideas through uh, some sort of additional subtext uh, by giving those raw ideas emotional content, sensuous content, and imaginative content. And this is basically the same thing you're looking for when you analyze any type of word choice, even just bare diction. You're looking for the emotions, the sensations, and the uh, ideas that come along with those words outside of their uh, denotative or literal meaning. When analyzing devices dealing with word choice, uh, you're looking at the same three questions that we uh, talked about with all text analysis, but here, uh, here's what, some, some questions that deal specifically with word choice. You're looking mainly at what the author is literally saying through the device, 
plus what emotions, sensations, and or ideas are associated with the device as it is used there, how the author uses these emotions, sensations, and or ideas to enhance his or her literal meaning, and finally, why this works the way it does. I know that's a lot of stuff to just throw at you right there, so let's take a look at an example of a trope that I've identified in Hawthorne's Custom House. There's tons in there. I just I didn't have to turn very far. I got to the second page before I found one that I really liked. Um, this is uh, Hawthorne talking about uh, his first descriptions of the Custom House. You'll probably remember this. Nevertheless, vixenly as she looks, she's referring to the uh, carved wooden eagle that looms over the front door. Vixenly as she looks, many people are seeking at this very moment to shelter themselves under the wing of the federal eagle, imagining, I presume, that her bosom has all the softness and snugness of an eider-down pillow. But she has no great tenderness, even in her best of moods, and sooner or later, oftener soon than late, is apt to fling off her nestlings with a scratch of her claw, a dab of her beak, or a rankling wound from her barbed arrows. Now, there's a lot of stuff in there I could talk about. I'm just going to pick... Uh, a couple things here. Hawthorne uses the tropes of personification and symbolism with the eagle there. He personifies the bald eagle, giving it human qualities. Of course, a, an eagle is an animal. An eagle um, cannot show truculence. An, <laughs> an eagle um, cannot have moods. So there is personification there. Also, the, the eagle is, is actually a symbol in and of itself, so he's employing symbolism as well. The eagle is a very common signal of America's uh, might and independence, that sort of thing. Thing. So let's talk about the, the, the what, the how, and the why. So what are we looking at? Um, what literally is the author saying by using this, um, by using this symbol uh, and this personification? Literally, the author is warning readers not to seek protection from, the American, from America, or at least from its government. Remember, Hawthorne was severely uh, annoyed, that's probably putting it politely, about having been fired from his, uh, from his government job at the Port of Salem. Um, and so he's kind of uh, hinting that, uh, that uh, we should not think that um, you know, our government really protects us like we, we want to think. Uh, how he goes about doing this? Well, I've already said it. He, personif he uses personification and symbolism. He personifies the bald eagle, which is a common symbol of America. And he's actually doing this, through doing this, he's playing upon um, our contrasting feelings toward the eagle. Uh, why? Why is he doing this? Here's where I really get into my analysis. Well, Hawthorne feels that he must point out the irony in a nation whose governors believe in the high-minded ideals of our founding fathers, but would at the same time act with such little regard for the people who depend on them for protection. Remember, Hawthorne was ousted from office not because he wasn't good at his job, but because he was the wrong political party. And you can imagine all of the the uh, the necessity for having you know a a wig at the port of Salem right that will really help the Whig party it was purely partisan politics it was it was favoritism uh, presidential favoritism um, and so he was very annoyed by that. And so he's trying to play on um, our natural feelings toward, uh, toward our nation and kind of point out some key irony uh, about, our belief, or about our feelings toward it. The, um, the initial description of the eagle evokes our feelings of national pride and patriotism, but this quickly turns to wariness and even outrage over the callousness of the bird as he, as he describes how it can just very quickly go from, um, go from or how it can quickly change change its mood, so to speak, to fling its own nestlings out of its nest, how, how callous and heartless it is. Hawthorne evokes these emotions, these um, kind of con contradicting emotions of our national pride versus feelings of, of uh, outrage and callousness. Uh, he evokes these emotions so that he can correct a misconception and remind readers that the symbol of freedom that our nation has chosen uh, is a bird of prey, a heartless predator, implying that the government is somehow symbolized, the, co the government that's symbolized in the bald eagle is, uh, is equally heartless, uh, is equally a sort of heartless predator, and at least it was from, from Hawthorne's point of view. The figurative language here works because it appeals to deep-seated feelings we have towards both sides of this symbol. Uh, first of all, predators are naturally somewhat frightening. That's just biological. Um, uh, predators are naturally 
basically somewhat uh, somewhat frightening, terrifying creatures on a very deep psychological level. Um, this view he juxtaposes with our patriotic pride, our appreciation of our nation's uh, you know best known symbol, um, and so these sort of competing feelings they strengthen that irony that Hawthorne is pointing out. Irony, by the way, is just when uh, an author tries to point. Uh, when an author tries to point out uh, the way something is that's not how we believe it should be or how we naturally expect it to be, um, that that's irony here. And so by giving us these sort of, by juxtaposing these contradicting feelings, our national pride with our fear of this thing, th that strengthens the very irony he's pointing out, that although we'd like to believe that our government is out for our best interests, when push comes to shove, they're just as likely to fling us out of the nest off the cliff uh, if it doesn't suit their politics. Yeah, so that right there, all of this stuff, you can see I've got a lot of material here. You can see I could turn this very easily into a good paragraph in an essay analyzing the style of the custom house or analyzing specifically like the metaphors that Hawthorne uses uh, in describing the custom house, those sorts of things. So let's talk about analyzing schemes. Schemes are uh, those uh, those devices that are used to, uh, or those devices dealing with word order arrangement with uh, with uh, the sound of words as well, dealing with uh, you know things like alliteration and assonance and consonance, the the vowel sounds and the um, the consonant sounds as well. Um, schemes are mainly employed to complement ideas through providing clarity and emphasis, and also through providing a sort of pleasing rhythm and sound. Uh, whoops, I've got a typo there. Um, Sometimes an author, especially poets do this, an author will write something the way they write it, use the words they use, purely because it does sound really cool. Because they're trying to create a certain rhythm that, that's pleasing to the ear, or pleasing to the eyes when read, those sorts of things. Um, there, are, That's why certain poems that we read just, just kind of sound so cool. It's because the author has taken time to really analyze some of the schemes that they employ. Um, when analyzing devices dealing with syntax and sound, we've actually done this already with our work with well-crafted sentence. Um, we've analyzed things like emphasis and clarity through various syntactic structures. And so you guys are already kind of doing this. But when we're doing a style analysis and we want to talk about some of the syntactic schemes, you're looking mainly at what the author is literally saying, Okay, just like when you're analyzing tropes, plus what the author is trying to clarify or emphasize or what sort of pleasing rhythm or sound the author is creating depending on what you think they're trying to do with that scheme how the author uses this to complement his or her ideas and then naturally why this works the way it does so it's those same three questions let's try an example of a, of a scheme that I found this one's toward the end of the custom house I didn't have to look very far I just kind of flipped to the to the end so it shows the first one from the beginning and uh, ah, here's a, a syntactic scheme we can look at. In the custom house, as before, in the old man's, I had spent three years, a term long enough to rest a weary brain, long enough to break off old intellectual habits and make room for new ones, long enough and too long to have lived in an unnatural state, doing what was really of no advantage nor delight to any human being, and withholding myself from toil that from toil that would, at least, have stilled an unquiet impulse in me. This is from the very end of the Custom House. It's like the third or fourth to last paragraph where Hawthorne is just kind of declaring that he is, uh, that he is, it's time for him to leave the Custom House. Um, here Hawthorne employs the schemes of repetition and parallel construction, uh, and he does this to create a sort of a, a coordinate series with three units, uh, each unit beginning with the uh, adverb phrase long enough. So that's what he's doing here. Let's break this down into our three questions. The what, what is he doing? Hawthorne <coughs> is declaring his time spent at the Custom House to be enough and saying that it's now time for him to return to more intellectual pursuits. How does he go about doing this? He employs a three-item coordinate series. The units are parallel, like, like they should be grammatically, um, and feature repetition of the adverb phrase long enough. That, that's, a, that's a choice he made there. He wanted to use that repeated adverb phrase. Why does he do this? Well, um, first of all, you always want to start with trying to figure out what the obstacles are that he's trying to overcome. Here, this is the climax of Hawthorne's Custom House sketch. This is what the, what the whole sketch has been building up to. So he must emphasize the importance of uh, his decision that he's made, this decision that, despite being fired, it really is time for him to move on anyway. 
Um, he provides his three reasons why um, in this statement and repeats the phrase long enough, I think for two reasons. I think it both provides clarity because the sentence is so long and it adds emphasis to the concept of long enough. Um, the repeated words help the reader better identify the beginnings of each item in the series. That's what I meant by clarity. We talked about this when we first started talking about uh, the concept when we discuss the way in which you can lengthen or shorten the slot into which a coordinate unit fits to either add repetition or create concision. Uh, and so here he's kind of, uh, he's lengthened that slot so that um, he creates the most repetition. Um, plus, this repeated concept, just the, the words long enough, naturally sticks out when we read it, further emphasizing Hawthorne's conviction toward leaving this place. It's enough, enough, enough. That, that emphasized concept of long enough uh, emphasizes that he's been there a long time and that it's more than enough. That's all I have for you with this uh, video over style analysis. Thank you for watching. Please feel free to watch it again, and I'll see you in class.